So, kind of want to double backwards and review a little bit more. Um, some of the review I'll per push faster through, okay? Largely organic chemistry is a study of interactions between two atoms, okay? And only two atoms. So everything that we do is driven based on the reaction of, or the interaction of those two atoms. So we need to come up with some way to classify those, and that's where things can become more and more difficult, okay? So before we get into even looking at those classifications, we should make sure that everybody's on the same page as far as what makes an atom, okay? So what components are there in an atom? That was a question. So we get our protons, neutrons, and our electrons. What's that? Is this chapter 1, PowerPoint? Chapter 1B. I, mean, I just posted it, I think, last night. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what information do we know about our protons, neutrons, and electrons? What about protons and neutrons? What's special about them? Okay, they're found together in the nucleus, and I think I heard the other statement that I wanted to hear. We can look at charges. It's the charge on a proton. We get a positive charge on a neutron. Neutral. Charge on electrons. Negative. Okay. Why do we have atoms? So if I take a proton and a neutron, that's nice, we've got a nucleus. Why do I have to add anything beyond just a proton and a neutron. Balance the charge. Balance the charge. Okay? And that's largely what we're going to do every time we look at individual reactions. We look to see where charge is established and how can I balance that charge better. Okay? So when we look at the structure of an atom, it's protons and electrons trying to stabilize. Okay? When we move into organic chemistry, we're starting to look at how those electrons shift around. Okay? So if that's our basic structure, when we evaluate a molecule, now we're going to take two atoms. So in this case, we've got carbon and hydrogen coming in near each other. What's the most likely part to interact between those two? It's the first thing they're going to find. Electrons. They're the furthest thing out there. Those are going to be the most important aspect. So a lot of organic chemistry is based on where the electrons are. Are they in bonds? Are they in non-bonds? What type of orbital are they in? Okay. So particularly in this first chapter, there's a lot of discussion about the specific locations of those electrons, and that's where you get hybridization theory and Lewis bonding and all sorts of other fun stuff. Okay. Um, taking a step further, let's go ahead and look at the electron configurations for some of these. Okay. So if the electrons are going to be the thing that's most likely to interact, we want to understand something about where those electrons are around each individual atom. Okay. And you'll typically see drawings, as we've got set up here, that kind of represent the electron configuration for each of these. Um, we've got a stack of periodic tables. Maybe a glide. Okay, no, we don't. Um, so if we go through and evaluate uh, electron configurations, you guys remember your orbitals, what orbitals there were? Okay, we've got S, P... D, F, and that can continue to go on um, forever in theory. We start to reach a point where the nucleus becomes so unstable. We've jammed so many positive protons into the nucleus that we can't add any more electrons okay, to balance out that charge. So our atoms or our structure starts to fall apart. Okay? When we're looking at organic chemistry, we're really only concerned about the S and P orbitals. Okay? So that's kind of nice. We can simplify things a lot there. Okay. But if we go through and total that up, that's only, what, four orbitals. How do four orbitals generate 115 elements? What's that? We end up getting shells of orbitals. Okay. So when we go through and look at a periodic table, there's different rows, uh, and things compile upon that. So what we end up with is our different energy shells. We start usually as a nice round number for one. And it starts 1s, okay? Once we've in that first energy shell, we can only have one orbital. It's stuck with the s orbital. We move to the next energy shell, and we get 2s and 2p, okay? 
That's as much as is mathematically, physically possible. So then we move to the next energy shell, and then we get 3s and 3p and 3d. Okay? And so we can start to build more and more from this. Okay? Further, these, each of these types of orbitals can break apart into suborbitals, if you will. Okay? And that has to do with, again, their mathematical features. I don't want to get too much into it, except to realize that the s orbitals, we can only have one type. So if we look at an s orbital, it comes out as a sphere. Okay? One of the reasons why we only get one type, if we change the perspective of how we look at that sphere, does it still look like a sphere? Okay? doesn't matter what angle you look at it, it's exactly the same. Okay, we don't lose any kind of three-dimensionality to it. When we move to the p orbital, we usually get a dumbbell shape, which I'm drawing pretty ugly, but you get the idea. Okay. What if we change our viewpoint? Instead of looking at our p orbital from the side, we looked at it from the end. Okay. Does it look different in that case? Yeah, it ends up looking something more along these lines, more like a sphere with maybe, if we're lucky, we could see something in back. And we find there's another way we could look at it. We could turn our viewpoint, and we end up with three possible orbitals. So when we move to the P-type orbital, we get three possibilities. Okay? When you move up to the D, you end up with five possible types. Okay? Well, why is this really important for us? Each of these orbitals can hold two electrons. Okay, what did we say the charge was on an electron? Negative. Negative. How can I fit two things in the exact same space that are both the same charge? We have opposite spins. So they aren't exactly the same. So when we look at putting electrons into each of these types of orbitals, we can fit two in. Okay? We can fit one spinning, say, to the left. The other one can spin to the right, and we don't get that repulsion. Okay? It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's all we really need to know. So in each of these orbitals, I can fit two electrons. So in that S type, I can fit two electrons. In this P, I can fit another two electrons. In that P, I can fit another two. In that P, I can fit another two. Okay. This allows us to build a lot more or a more extensive structure fairly rapidly, and we aren't fixed to just four different types, but now energy levels as well as subcategories within those. Okay, so we can build from these a lot. So when we're going to go through and look at our electron configurations, we go back to our basic subshell categories as we move up and start to apply how many electrons can fit. And in S orbital, how many electrons can we get in there? Two. So our maximum would be 1s2. We say there's two electrons there. If we continue to add electrons, we then move to the 2s. How many electrons can we fit in an s? 2. What happens when we move to the 2p? Okay. Each p orbital can hold only two electrons, but remember we have three types of p orbitals. So it becomes 2p6. Okay. 3s, 2, 3p6. We won't worry about D, okay, because we won't see those. So when we're going to look at electron configurations, we're going to focus on how many electrons necessary to build upwards. So we could sum this up, and this would give us the electron configuration for ne not neon. What's below that? Argon? There we go, argon. That'll give us the electron configuration for argon, okay? So anything less than that, will stop us at the electron configuration for one of the other elements. If we now look at our electron configuration, we're going to compare when we see these two atoms get near each other, which set of these electrons, let's say argon comes in and starts to interact with another argon, which electrons are going to interact first? The valence, also known as the outer shell. Well, where's the outer shell? In this case, that'll be our 3s and our 3p electrons. Okay, so if we're going to look at our valence shell, we're concerned out there. How many electrons are out there? Eight. If you guys briefly remember from the terrible lecture on Monday when we talked about Lewis structures, 
we had what was referred to as the octet rule. Why was it the octet rule? Because when Lewis first tried to build these structures and come up with models to represent these things, he looked at the very simplest elements first. And what he started to notice was these patterns. If we move up one row into the two energy shell, eight electrons. The third energy shell, eight electrons. So our basic structure, our basic understanding of Lewis structure and bonding comes from the s and the p orbitals needing eight total electrons to make them completely satisfied and look like a noble gas. Okay? So if we're now going to take this a little bit further, it's again a story of two atoms interacting. So let's make it goofy. If we take two atoms completely independent of each other floating around in free space, zero interaction, okay? we could treat these like people, complete perfect strangers. What happens if one of those says, say, maybe winks at the other one? Okay, maybe it looks at them a little bit weird. Okay, now we're getting some kind of attractive force. Okay, maybe if it's the correct perfect alignment, what happens? They start dating. Okay, so we end up with different classes for those interactions. Atoms are very, very similar. Okay, we want to see what different interactions and classes can allow these things to interact properly. Until ultimately, when we're looking at interactions of humans, we can go to the full-on scale of being married, okay? And in theory, equal sharing, okay? Of course, we always get classes within that, okay? So if we move to our equivalent when we're looking at atoms, okay, organic chemistry, we get bond types. So we came up with three particular bond classifications. Here you guys all remember these from 130 or 151-ish. Okay, we get three main bond types, ionic, polar covalent, and covalent. Okay, one of the big things that's going to help a lot when moving through this semester is being able to recognize these bond types immediately. Given an individual structure, being able to immediately jump on it and say that's an ionic bond. That's a covalent bond. That's a polar covalent bond. So we'll talk about how or why that's important in a little bit. So before we get there, how can we figure out which one's which? Anybody have to remember any rules for identifying any of these? How the electrons, how the electrons transfer? Or yeah. if, or if they do. Where the electrons are actually being shared. So in the case of the intramolecular bond, we're looking at electron sharing. Okay. In an ionic situation, you would expect to find what? Metal with a Okay, metal with a nonmetal. Okay, how many of you know which ones your metals are? Okay, two hands. So, metal and a nonmetal, while a reasonable, acceptable definition in most cases, is going to serve most of you pretty useless. So, let's try again. What else could we look for? It's another definition I was hoping to hear. Looking for a difference in electronegativity typically symbolizes this. That difference in electronegativity needs to be what? So this is the strict definition behind it. And by strict, I mean every textbook seems to have a slightly different definition. For ionic, a difference in electronegativity greater than about 1.7. So if the difference is greater than 1.7, that's going to be an ionic bond. Those of you frantically writing this down should think for a moment here, how many of you know the electronegativities of any of the elements? Pretty useless definition again. So let's try again. Position of the periodic table. Left and right side. What does ionic mean? Ions. What's an ion? Give me an example of an ion. Charged atom. Give me an example of a charged atom. Make it easier. You said before or after sodium. Plus, minus. If you see ions, what type of bond do you have? An ionic bond. You don't have to worry about the differences in electronegativity. You don't have to even remember metals versus nonmetals. If you see ions, you have an ionic bond. So if we go back and look at this structure, okay, I know I'm asking you to now think back to what we did a little bit with our Lewis structure and some of the simplifications. 
Do we see any bonds that might be classified within here? Where do we have the ionic bond? Between the plus and the minus. We wouldn't just circle the plus and the minus, we'll circle the atoms that are associated with them. So we're looking at sodium ion coordinating to O minus. Okay? There's an ionic bond. Okay? That allows us to see some immediate reactivity because we have pluses and minuses. Okay? And if I have a negative charge, what do I want to do? I want to stabilize that. How? How do we cancel a negative? With a positive. Okay? So we can start to predict something about the reactivity by identifying these characteristics. Where it gets more interesting and more difficult is when we move into the other bond classes. Which one do you want to look at first, polar covalent or covalent? Okay, covalent. That's where I wanted you to go. That's why I kept waiting until I heard that answer. <laughs> so, okay, push it a little bit further. It's not just technically sharing, right? I'm sure your professors or previous instructors pushed this even further. No. Fill in the blank, right? I can't spell very well. I can't count that out. <laughs> what is it typically? Complete. Complete equal sharing of electrons. Which? Yeah, that's an E. That's an E minus for E for electron and then the negative charge to help make the E more obvious in the future, at least. Okay. So how do we figure out if something's completely sharing electrons? How do we figure out something wasn't completely sharing electrons? Well, we said metal and a nonmetal. So it's probably metals and metals. This is organic chemistry, so that's a useless definition. How about nonmetals and nonmetals? That's better, except a large section of the periodic table deals with nonmetals and nonmetals. Okay, so that's not going to be perfect. Okay, so nonmetals, so that could work. But again, most of our organic chemistry is going to involve nonmetals anyway. So that's not going to be good enough, particularly because we're, we now have metals, and if we say this is all nonmetals, what do we have left for polar covalent? Okay, that doesn't really give us anything for that definition. We could go to electronegativity. Okay, if we have complete equal sharing of electrons, what would you expect the difference in electronegativity to be? Zero. Okay? And that is the strictest definition for a covalent bond. Okay? However, that definition is typically so strict that it excludes a lot of things that we would typically classify or put into a category of not reactive. Okay? So what we're going to do is expand that definition. Okay? Instead of just saying complete sharing of electrons, which can really only happen if it's an atom... <coughs> um, bound to the same atom, so carbon to carbon, oxygen to oxygen. We're going to expand that ever so slightly to also include carbon to hydrogen bonds. Okay? Water is extremely polar. Okay? So now what do we do with polar covalent? Everything else in between, okay? Which is, as bad as it may sound, the definition that I'm going to give you, okay? Except remember, one of the things that we talked about uh, on Monday was that everything else in between is going to be a very narrow selection of atoms. Okay? Remember, we simplify our periodic table a lot. So whenever we see anything bound to... Nitrogen, oxygen, or a halogen. What were the halogens? What elements? Fluorine. You're thinking noble. Fluorine. 
chlorine, bromine, and iodine. If you see a bond to any one of those elements, that bond is now polar covalent. Okay? If we go back to our structure, we've got polar covalent bonds here and here. What do we do for our covalent bonds? Well, remember, did I talk about one of the simplifications with what a point is? Did I actually say that or you remember that? Okay, then take my word for it at this point. That's a covalent bond, that's a covalent bond. There's also a hydrogen out here, that's also a covalent bond. We'll come back to that definition in a little bit or that simplification that's a little bit more difficult to do at this point. Okay? Questions about that? Yes? So hydrogen bonding is a misnomer. Okay? The biggest issue with hydrogen bonding is it is not a bond. It's a force. Okay? They are extremely related, and we will talk about that when we move into functionality, which is kind of the tail end of Chapter 1 and moves into Chapter 2 a little bit. Okay? Um, but yeah, that one's tricky, so kind of ignore that for the moment. Other questions about bonds? Okay. Your textbook and the homework problems I assign uh, has you, or you'll see this because of the homework problems I assign, has you classify bonds based very, very strictly on the differences in electronegativity. Okay? So if you're using the solutions manual, it may tell you that there's something slightly different. Okay? And that's because they're doing it strictly based on the difference in electronegativity. And if you run your definitions in that case, some things that I would classify as polar covalent end up looking ionic. And some things that you would classify as ionic, believe it or not, can sometimes even shift all the way down to covalent, depending on the atoms used. Okay? The electronegativity difference, while it, in its strictest sense, is the absolute correct answer, it does not allow you to see anything about the reactivity, <coughs> which is why I'm giving you these clues. For an ionic situation, you want that positive and negative. You're looking for those ions. If you can find that, it's an ionic bond. Polar covalent, if you see anything bound to nitrogen, oxygen, or a halogen, that is polar covalent bond. Its reactivity is going to reflect that polar covalent type bond, regardless of what the strict definition says. Okay? Does that make sense? So, kind of want to push through some periodic trends here. Um, we'll go to the simplified version of the periodic table in just a second. I think it's on the next slide. Um, but I want to make sure you guys are aware of some of these trends. Size. Okay. Anybody know any trends for size? Okay. I'm hearing lots of angles and acrosses. I'm pretty sure I know what you were taught. First off, the only one I want you to remember as far as size goes, I can color code this, let's do that. As you move down a column, your atoms get bigger. Okay? As you move across a row, what happens to the atomic size? Typically gets smaller. If it's an ion, what happens to it? The opposite gets bigger. Okay? There's a reason I'm not writing that down up there. Okay? And that's because that difference in size is so subtle that when it comes to determining our reactivity in organic chemistry, across an individual row, there is no size difference. Okay? It's negligible. Okay? So size is going to become an important thing to evaluate when we go through and try and predict reactivity. Okay? So remember that. If we're moving down a column, we're getting much larger, across, no difference. Okay? How about electronegativity? When we're looking at our electronegativity, it increases from left to right. How else does it increase? Bottom to top. Okay? So our most electronegative is fluorine. And then it goes oxygen, nitrogen, and then kind of gets a bit dicey figuring it out from there. Okay? So in general, that's your electronegativity trends. What about orbitals? Okay. 
we pull orbital information out of the periodic table. Okay, and I know I did mention this on Monday, but I probably didn't do a very good job highlighting it. Okay, where can we get orbital information? Relative to the columns, this column is sometimes referred to as the S block. Why is it the S block? Because the valence shell are the S orbitals. Okay, how about this block in the middle, which we won't evaluate ever again? We're looking at our D block or D orbitals. The section over here, our P. Okay. So we can get some orbital information out of the periodic table. How about valence electrons? To what orange? Each group Okay. When we go through and count it out, hydrogen has how many valence electrons? One. It only has one, so it makes sense for it to only be one. How about helium? It has to have two. So helium's a bit weird. We're so small in the periodic table that it becomes a bit more difficult to follow those patterns. Helium and hydrogen, sometimes you'll see helium duplicated right above beryllium here, right next to hydrogen. And sometimes you'll see hydrogen duplicated next to helium. Okay, they're pretty much in their own separate class. How many valence electrons does lithium have? One. How many did hydrogen have? One. Exactly the same. We balance electrons of beryllium have two, which also happens to be one column larger than hydrogen. What happens when we move to boron? Has three. Well, two plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It isn't really three, so why is it three? Okay. Remember, we're treating these as each as separate blocks. Okay. When we're at that two energy level, we haven't reached the d orbitals yet. So we won't fill in the d orbitals. Okay? So what we're looking at here is now moving to the 2p orbital. We're adding one electron to it. We still have two electrons from our 2s. We're up to three valence electrons. How about carbon? Four. Okay. So your periodic table can give you some information about the valence electrons. Okay. So I can go through and write that across. We got one, two, three, four, six, seven, even say eight. Okay. So that could be helpful, but we're probably not going to look at valence electrons very much after the probably third or fourth week here. So let's try and find something about bonds. Okay, how many bonds can hydrogen have? One. How many bonds can lithium have? One. Okay, it ends up matching. So as far as our bonds go, hydrogen can only have one. Beryllium. How many bonds? Two. Two. Okay, what happens when we move to boron? Three bonds. Oh, this pattern's looking pretty nice. How about carbon? Four. Nitrogen. Three. Okay, it starts to go down. Okay, so what happens with oxygen? Two. Two. Our halogens? One. Okay, and that has to do with how we're filling electrons in to make it look like the noble gas. So when we look at lithium, it can ditch one electron to look like helium. Beryllium can ditch two electrons to look like helium. Boron can ditch three electrons or gain five. Eh, gaining five is an awful lot. So let's ditch the three. There's our three bonds. Carbon, gain or lose four electrons either way. That sounds pretty reasonable. Carbon can sit pretty happy at four bonds. What happens with nitrogen? We only want to gain three more electrons, okay, as opposed to losing all five to bonds. Okay? And that's why we cap out at four. Nitrogen will only pick up three bonds. Okay. Questions about our trends? Good, because I don't want to talk anymore about them.
atomic bonding and structure. We said we went through and simplified a lot of this. Okay? So you're primarily going to be responsible for those. We don't have to stress too much about any of the other elements. Um, so I would recommend doing the electron configurations for these, understanding uh, the bonds possible for each of these, going through and practicing lots and lots of problems trying to figure those out. Okay? We got our S blocks. We'll fill these according to lowest energy. Lowest energy here is mainly in red because we're going to keep seeing that phrase. Okay? Everything in organic chemistry is striving for lowest energy. So we're always going to try and fill from our lowest energy first. Okay? So now that we understand something about the atoms, we can scale upwards and look at uh, molecular bonding. I went through a couple examples. We're going to go through a couple more um, in just a second. The couple examples I picked happen to be easier. So let's move to some harder examples. Okay? In particular, where two big things that typically cause students problems. Resonance and formal charge, the two big ones. When we're dealing with resonance, okay, just like electronegativity in size, it's one of the most common answers to a why question in organic chemistry. Why did this reaction work? Because of resonance. Okay? Why did I not do as well on this exam? Well, because of resonance. Okay? It really does come in and, and have a really important role. A couple of things that are really important. We can only move electrons. This becomes less obvious in cases where we start to make simplifications, which hopefully we'll talk about before uh, the night is done. Okay? So only move electrons. You can never pick up an atom and move it to a new location. Okay? As far as what electrons you're allowed to move. And remember, we said electrons can move all over the place. Um, there's very particular electrons that we can adjust and try and push around. Non-bonding electrons and pi electrons, okay? We haven't discussed the term pi yet. What we're referring to is multiple bonds, okay? So if I have a double bond, those electrons in that double bond can move, okay? Just the double bond part of it, not the single bond part of it, okay? As far as how we can move those electrons, atom to bond, bond to atom. Those are the two ways we can move it. If you get lazy, you can move bond to bond, but only if you get lazy. Okay, officially, you should be moving it in those first two options. I'll tell you right now, I'm lazy. Okay, so let's go through come up some of the examples. When we did CO2, okay, we drew that out. Does anybody mind if I just kind of jump through some of the hoops all the way to it? Okay, I'm going to take that as nobody minds. We went up with our basic structure. We said we had to have 18 electrons around it, so we went through according to Mike's rules, put all the electrons into it, Mike, by the way, is referring to me, not somebody in the class, just so you know. I don't want to throw somebody under the bus. We could put in our 18 electrons. Where we've got electrons between atoms, we can now say that's a bond. To show it's a bond, instead of showing the dots, that's where we bring in our line. We now evaluate octet rules. Okay? All of the P-block elements, except for boron and aluminum that we'll deal with, uh, should have eight electrons around them. Okay? That has to do with how many bonds they've got. Oxygen has its eight. The other oxygen has its eight. Carbon does not. Okay? So what we would do in the process of building this structure is say, okay, I need to fix that. I'm going to take two electrons from an oxygen and shift them towards the carbon. Okay? That's great. That helps out because now the carbon can pick up some more electrons. Remember, I'm not picking them off of that oxygen. I'm only shifting them into a bond. In the process, I've added two more electrons into the space. I add another line. The oxygen now has two lone pairs. Carbon's still missing electrons, so I can move in another pair of electrons to help satisfy it. And we end up with yet another structure. And this would be ultimately the one that almost everybody would settle on, which is fine. That's, you know, reasonable, acceptable. Okay. What we've done indirectly, okay, by coming to this answer, by starting where I told you to start or where I want you to start, is we've already started to move electrons, one of the most difficult skills in organic chemistry to master. <laughs> 
Okay? We found some electrons and we moved them. Okay? Each of these structures is correct. It is a possible way to describe the structure. We don't like the first two because it invalidates one of Lewis's rules, which was we have to have eight electrons around um, carbon. Okay? There happens to be another reason why we don't like them. We'll come back to that. I guess we'll address that now. Before we can finalize our structure, we then have to go through and evaluate for formal charge. Okay? There's a couple different ways. Oh, you'll understand why in a second here. There went all my work. To evaluate formal charge, there's a couple different formulas that you can end up using. The formula that I recommend, if, ah, stop it. If you don't notice some patterns here, it's a lazy formula. Okay, why is it lazy? Well, let's go through and address it. To calculate our formal charge, let's start with, say, our carbon in the middle. We need to figure out how many valence electrons carbon has. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. Okay, so it's not how many electrons are around it currently, it's how many electrons does carbon bring in to start this structure. Carbon brings in four valence electrons. Okay, 2s2 and 2p2. So four valence electrons minus the number of non bonding electrons. How many electrons are not bonded and associated with carbon? Zero. Minus the number of bonds. There are four bonds there. What do we get? Zero. So the charge on carbon? Zero or neutral. How do we specify that? We don't write anything. That's nice. Okay? Where does this definition really change or where my formal charge formula changes? It comes right down in this section right here. General chemistry, one of the primary things and arguably the only things that you were taught in general chemistry, begins with a U, rhymes with twit. I think it does. <laughs> Unit. Oh. Hey, I was close. Come on, that was not bad. It's the first thing I came up with. I said it, that wasn't going to work. Okay. Units. Why is that important? Well, what are the units on valence electrons? <coughs> electrons. What are the units on non-bonding electrons? Electrons. What are the units on the number of bonds? Electrons divided by two. Bonds. Okay. So if we taught you this formula to begin with, we then go back on everything that we were trying to teach you that whole semester, which was the units were important. Guess what? This isn't general chemistry anymore. Units aren't important. For organic chemistry. Okay. So as long as you can find some formula that works and gets you to the correct answer of it being neutral, you're fine. Okay? Why did I want to go back and refer to this with this structure? Well, if we go back to the previous compound that we had before, this was the other, come on, this was the other structure that I had drawn. Okay? And we said this was bad because of the octet issue. Okay? It didn't satisfy its octet. Is there a question? Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, what's the first arrow? Like I understand that you've got zero. This arrow? No, zero. Oh, zero. <laughs> Sorry. Non-bonding electrons. How many electrons are attached to the carbon? We're only concerned about the carbon here because that's where we're figuring out our formal charge. So we skipped on beyond this to our final answer from here because our octet wasn't satisfied. There's another thing that's potentially wrong with it. Okay? If we go through and evaluate formal charge, let's start with our carbon first. How many valence electrons does this carbon bring in? It's kind of a trick question. It's the same. Four minus the number of non-bonding electrons. How many non-bonding electrons around it? There's still zero. There's nothing around that carbon. Okay. 
Okay, minus the number of bonds. How many bonds are there? What do we get? Plus one, meaning our carbon is positively charged. Okay, so just based on that, comparing it across, we would say this structure is a problem because it's charged. We don't like charge. Everything we do in organic chemistry is to neutralize charge. Okay. What's the overall charge on a molecule of CO2? So if we look at the formula, where do we find the overall charge? It's zero. How do you know it's zero? Upper right-hand corner, what's the number you see? Nothing, also known as zero. Okay? So our overall charge is zero. If I found a positive charge, what does that mean? I have to be able to find somewhere else in the structure. A negative charge. So we can go through and calculate the formal charge on this oxygen. How many electrons does oxygen, valence electrons does oxygen bring in? Six for oxygen minus the number of non-bonding electrons. There are six. This is also a slight difference what, than what you might see in textbooks. A lot of textbooks refer to it as pairs. So how many non-bonding electron pairs are there? So that's where it gets confusing. What number do we actually want? We want the number of electrons. Okay, so how many electrons are not in bonds around that oxygen? Six minus the number of bonds. One, six minus six minus one gives us negative one. What's the charge on that oxygen? Negative one. Okay. This structure is bad because we have charge, in a particular separation of charge. Okay. Separation of charge you can witness as being bad. You ever have those 9-volt batteries, right? Okay. Stick your tongue to it. <laughs> okay. That's separation of charge in a battery. Okay. Why is it bad? Well, you stick your tongue to it and you'll find out. But be aware. It will kind of hurt. Okay. That's what's happening here. We're building up that charge. It wants to balance out if it can. Okay. CO2 is a nice structure because it can balance out. Okay. But this first resonance structure gives us some idea of how that compound can react. <coughs> Whereas when we look at this neutral one, we don't see any positives or minuses. We assume it doesn't react at all. CO2 can react. Okay. Yeah? I think you answered it. So even if it's unbalanced, it's still considered a resonance structure. Yes. What if, I mean, can you do anything like a triple bond between the oxygen and the carbon? Is that um, in this case, can we do a triple bond between the oxygen and the carbon? Which triple bond where? On, on the left side, just take two more of the lone pairs and attach them to the carbon. So when we were at this position, or this compound, we said we needed more electrons for that, or for that carbon, right? And we went to the most likely source, the one we didn't look at. Okay, why did we do that? Symmetry. Everybody likes symmetry. That's why we have two arms, two legs, two eyes, two noses, maybe your cross-eyed. Okay. There's another reason behind it. The reason is that that negative is unstable. We want to stabilize it. But it doesn't have to be that source of electrons. We could have just as easily pulled the electrons from the other side. What's the result if we moved our electrons from over there? We get a triple bond. Carbon great is now neutral. That's fantastic because it's got those four bonds. <coughs> What happens to the oxygen on the right that I just drew the lone pairs on? Still negative. What happens to the oxygen on the left? It becomes positive. Our overall structure is still neutral. And yes, that is a possible valid or a possible resonance structure. Is it a good one? No. Why is it not good? Okay, we still have charges. Now between these two, though. Which one's better, top or bottom? Ooh, that one's kind of dicey there, now that I think about it. I would argue that the bottom one's better. Why? Huh? Because they're next to each other? Charges, we want to get as close as possible to each other. The further we separate them, okay, the more likely they're going to come back to each other, like a rubber band. Okay? You'd be kind of afraid if I walked around with a rubber band on the end of my finger. Okay? It's the same thing that's happening here. The other thing, oxygen versus carbon. 
We just talked about periodic trends. What periodic trend can we use to compare carbon and oxygen? The oxygen's more electronegative. What's the definition of electronegativity? The ability to hold not just electrons, very particular type, bonding electrons. So if we take a look at these three bonds, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, meaning it's going to hold its bonding electrons tighter than carbon, which means where's that extra pi bond likely going to spend most of its time? On the oxygen, okay, leaving the carbon positive. Okay? So you get these kind of subtle nuances within some of the resonance rules. Most cases, what I want you to do is look at those extra resonance structures for reactivity. Okay. Questions about resonance, formal charge? Okay, let's not do that example yet. So one of the things that you're, in theory, going to pick up through doing all of these Lewis structures is some patterns coming out of um, solving all of these. Okay. If you're given a carbon atom and it's in its neutral state, it needs to have four bonds. It says nothing about what type of bonds, being single, double, or triple. It just has to have four okay, for it to be neutral. For nitrogen to be neutral, three bonds, you'll notice something else changes. It still has to have its octet. Okay. What else changed? We also have that lone pair. Okay, so nitrogen in its neutral state will have a lone pair and three bonds. When we move <coughs> to oxygen, two bonds, two lone pairs. Okay. As we go through and change the charges on each of these, that's going to change what, how many bonds can actually attach to them. Okay. So when we're positive, you'll notice that we start to lose octets. So carbon has lost its octet. Okay. Nitrogen still maintains its octet, and so does oxygen. Okay. What happens when we go negative? Does carbon have its octet? Yep. Okay. What happens to nitrogen? Still has its octet. Oxygen still has its octet. Okay. So we can ultimately lose or gain octets um, depending on different situations. Okay. It's just going to depend on what you're working with. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, no, I did want to do this. Um, so, back to kind of comparing Lewis to reality. So, one of the conclusions that Lewis would come up with is we could get a Lewis structure, say, for methane. And we would draw something like this. Okay, and this is what we kind of talked about as we ended class on Monday. What's the bond angle? So if we go through, sorry, not bond angle. If we look at CH4, okay, is this hydrogen any different than any of those other hydrogens? No, which means all of those bonds need to be 100% equivalent. Okay? There can't be a difference between them. So we could go through and start to compare them. Well, it's all between carbon and hydrogen. There's all a line connecting them. Those are some good similarities. I've even circled all of them. But then we could also go through and look at bond angles. What's that bond angle? 90, 90, and 90. And of course, if we look at patterns, we might say, oh, that's fine, except there's always the smart Alex that can go, oh, look at the opposite. What's the bond angle there? 180. They aren't all exactly equal. Okay? So Lewis's theory doesn't satisfy what we would predict. If we've got four equivalent groups of electrons around that, we would expect all of those four equivalent groups to separate away from each other as best as possible. Okay? And so that's where the Vesper models came in and said, you know what, Lewis, your drawings aren't quite perfect. I want to tweak them ever so slightly. Okay? And that's where we get our different shapes. Okay? This becomes problematic for students. Why would that become problematic for students? If we were going to try and draw a tetrahedral <coughs> shape, okay, it occupies three dimensions. But if you take a look at your pen and paper, that doesn't occupy three dimensions. So we have to be able to rely on our artistry skills to convert 
a two-dimensional drawing into three dimensions, manipulate it in three dimensions, okay, either with a model kit or in your head, answer whatever question was asked, and then convert back into two dimensions to write down the answer. Okay? This gets exceedingly difficult in later chapters. So we're going to come up with some notations that can allow us to see this a little bit better. For a tetrahedral shape, where we've got four electron groups, three atoms will try and draw as simply as possible, all in the same plane. So when we draw it out, the line represents something in the plane of the paper. Okay, here it just happens to be angled to reflect the correct structure. The other two hydrogens are now going to be out of the plane of the paper. To represent that, we'll use our wedge to signify a hydrogen is coming out of the paper at us, and we'll use a dash to signify a hydrogen going away from us, okay, or any atom going away from us. <coughs> so what Vesper did is just looked at those electron groups and said, all our poly exclusion principles said we could only fit two electrons, and that was because we had opposite spins. If we're going to fit more electrons around an individual atom, we're going to have to give those uh, electrons more space. Okay? And that's why we ended up with those particular shapes. Okay? That's where we get, come on, our geometries. Most of what we're going to do this semester sits nicely in that tetrahedral geometry. Okay? At this point, though, we've said all of those electron groups or all of those bonds are 100% the same. There is no difference. Okay, so that's how we get tetrahedral. If we go through, say, for a different atom, okay, we might end up finding out that we only have three electron groups, okay, in which case we're looking at trigonal planar. Okay. Anybody know what atom is going to give you trigonal planar most commonly? Nope. Nope. Boron and aluminum are the two that you're primarily concerned with. They're going to end up shifting into the trigonal planar geometry. Okay? We can see multiple bonds, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, generate trigonal planar as well. We'll deal with that when we start scaling up beyond single bonds. Okay? The next question is, are all orbitals equal? So if we looked at the Lewis structure for, say, methane versus ammonia, when we draw out methane, Slippery little guy. No, it just <laughs> flew out of my hands. When we draw methane, come on. When we draw methane, we have four equivalent groups. When we draw ammonia or NH3, if you draw, drew out the Lewis structure first, you'd end up finding out how many bonds should nitrogen have? Three and one lone pair. So you can either go through all those Lewis structure drawings of all those rules and counting valence electrons, or you remember that nitrogen needs three bonds and a lone pair. How many groups of electrons are around that nitrogen? We've got three bonds and a lone pair, which means four groups, which means our tetrahedral shape. So if we were going to try and, man, if we were going to try and draw that out, There's kind of our Vesper shape for it. Okay. Is that still strictly going to be 109 degrees, 109.5, or that strict tetrahedral shape? Yeah. And technically not, because the lone pair is different than the bonds, which means the bond angle changes ever so slightly. And because it changes enough, of course, somebody had to come along and say, you can't call that a tetrahedron. You have to call it something else. And that's where we get the other shapes showing up. Okay. That's where you get your trigonal pyramidal and your bent shapes. Okay. So carbon in its natural state or its four-bonded state, we're looking at a tetrahedron. Nitrogen in its three-bonded state, trigonal pyramidal. Oxygen, neutral state, bent. Okay. Even though we've changed the valence electrons, there are still four electron groups. It just happens that the electron groups change from being a bond to a non-bonding pair. Okay. 
So be aware that those names may float around. They may kind of confuse you. We're ultimately referring back to that tetrahedral class. If you happen to remember any of the other shapes out there and as far as Vesper models go, you can very quickly ignore them. Okay? Because we don't need to worry about those. So this is really where I wanted to hit some simplifications. So when you go through and draw out these Lewis structures, you're going to first off be irritated that I've asked you so many problems about it and kind of get sick and tired of it. We already talked about some of the reasons why we're having you do it. One is it's the beat into your head that carbon needs four bonds, nitrogen three with a lone pair, oxygen two, two lone pairs. Okay, it's to really press that home so that you guys get familiar with what the different states are, what the different bond structures are. The other big thing is to realize that it's very tedious to have to draw out every single atom. Okay? So as organic chemists, we came back and said, you know what, let's simplify things a little bit more. Okay? So we've talked about some. We're primarily looking at eight elements. We simplified our shapes, and now we're going to simplify our drawings as well. Okay? So first off, we brought in three-dimensionality with wedges and dashes. Okay? But then the next big thing when we get into Lewis structures is because carbon is going to be the most prolific atom used, we're going to start to imply its presence by just the sheer presence of a point. So if I draw this, nobody? Okay. I draw a point. Yeah. I draw a point. I've now already implied the presence of a carbon. Okay, what happens if now instead of drawing a point, let's erase all that so we can refer back to it, I draw this. Line's not a point, but it's two points that are connected by a bond. So what I'm implying by drawing that line is that I have a carbon here and a carbon there. Okay, next thing. We'll also find that hydrogen kind of acts as a space filler, shows up in a lot of individual structures. So we also want to avoid having to draw out every single hydrogen in every single case. So what we're going to do is imply the presence of hydrogen when attached to a carbon. Okay? Well, how many hydrogens should we be adding? Depends on the structure we're dealing with. How many bonds was carbon supposed to have? Four. How many bonds do our carbons currently have right now? One. So how many bonds are missing to this carbon? What should those three bonds be? Hydrogen. So again, that straight line now doesn't imply just the carbons, but it also implies the presence of those hydrogens. Okay? And the same on the other side, because we can get varying levels of laziness, we could draw each bond, or we could just write H with the three subscript after it saying we've got three of them. Okay? Make sense? Next big rule when it comes to this. Never, ever, ever imply a charge. Doesn't happen. Okay? The main reason it doesn't happen is because of rule B. Hydrogens are implied. Okay? So if I draw out a carbon with three bonds, okay, I can't just say, oh, well, that's a positively charged carbon or a negatively charged carbon. I have to assume that there's a hydrogen attached to it. So if you're going to draw out a structure, you must specify the formal charge okay, if you know that structure is charged. If you don't know, what do you need to do? You need to find out. Calculate the formal charge for every single atom in the structure. Or again, have that chart memorized. So you know, oh, that carbon only has three bonds, positively charged. Okay? Next big simplification. This is something that every professor is guilty of. I'm going to try my best to avoid making this simplification because it's very confusing for students, particularly when we start looking at the reactivity of individual molecules. Nitrogen, oxygen, and your halogens, okay, almost always have implied non-bonding electrons. Okay, that's an extremely dangerous concept or extremely dangerous thing to do. Okay, why would that be a problem? What did we say was the most important thing when it came to the structure of an atom? The electron. 
okay? Which electrons do you think are going to be most likely to react? Ones that are currently occupied in a bond or floating off doing nothing? Floating off doing nothing is probably going to be the most reactive. If we start to imply those non-bonding electrons, very often we forget that they're there and we stop using them in our reactions. Okay? Or we, are assume, we assume that we're done with the reaction when we haven't taken into consideration those electrons. Okay? Your textbook almost right away is going to start implying those lone pairs okay? up to, again, that table. If it's negatively charged, the negatively charged oxygen, how many lone pairs are implied? Negative one charge, how many lone pairs are implied on an oxygen? So if we take a look for an example here, say hydroxide, one. Oh, whoops, hey, I wasn't supposed to draw on the lone pairs. Never mind, you didn't see that. If we said something like this, how many lone pairs are implied on that oxygen? Three. Okay. You're responsible for knowing that there are those three present. Okay. Questions about some of these simplifications? Okay. Um, we got on the next slide. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm going to have to cheat go back real quickly. C2H6O. C2H6O. Okay. One of the most common things that you get taught in general chemistry is the proper way to draw out formulas. Okay. So it has to be anion, cation, cation, anion, correct numbering, all this correct organization. We put a lot of emphasis on formulas. Okay. Tell you right now, if you draw formulas for any answer that I ever ask or for any question that I ever ask, I will take off points. Okay, why? Provide the form or the structure for this compound. Provide the structure for that formula, C2H6O. Go ahead. See what you can do. If you got questions, you can raise your hand. I can try and give you some places to start. Same formula, two compounds, two structures, both of them perfectly valid. Why is that a problem? Well, what you're going to swiftly or start to look, we'll talk about on Wednesday, I think, this functional group. So we'll start to, start to classify different arrangements of atoms as particular functional groups. The functional group where we have an oxygen bound to a hydrogen and a carbon. Alcohol. In fact, ethanol. That's fun. What happens when we move down here? This functional group is an ether. Different functional group. Why do you think we call it a different name? Different reactivity. Extremely different reactivity. Ethanol is an arguably fun <coughs> liquid to drink. Methyl ether very arguably not a fun <laughs> liquid to drink. Okay? 
probably in its gas state most common, okay? highly, highly volatile. Our chemistry changes drastically from changing just the sheer location of where our oxygen is located, which means our formula is virtually meaningless. Okay? So we don't want to use formulas anymore. Okay? This includes for anybody in the lab too. Okay? So what we can do is start to convert formulas into Lewis structures, which is ultimately what we want you to start getting into. Okay? From the Lewis structure, we could say that's a bit extended. So let's try and condense it a little bit. So let's stick with ethanol. So we can go through and take a look at that structure and say, you know what? That is a bit too much for me. I'm going to condense it down. I've got a carbon bound to a carbon, bound to an oxygen, bound to a hydrogen. Whoops. I didn't give myself enough space. Let me try that again. I've got a carbon bound to a carbon. My first carbon had three hydrogens on it. My second carbon had two hydrogens on it. And NOH. You'll notice that I've shown some bonds and not others. I could take that even further. CH3, CH2, OH. Noting the formatting on how it's drawn out. So there's a couple different ways we could do this. Okay, and we'll erase that middle one, show the other way. You might also see this compound written out as this. Which one is correct? Both. They're both perfectly valid. Why do we pick one over the other? Personal preference is really all that comes down to. Um, Typically, you'll see the hydrogen swap locations. In this case, because we're looking at a chain, it almost always goes carbon, then hydrogen. Okay? You very, fairly rarely see this. But given a larger structure, if you were looking at just a CH3 attached to a much larger structure, you might see it written out as H3C so that we can see the connectivity between the next group. This carbon is bound to this carbon. Whereas up here, it looks like this carbon's bound to that hydrogen that's been bound to that carbon. Well, hydrogen can't bond to carbon. Okay. So it just comes down to kind of a personal preference on how you align and where you draw your structures. Okay. I probably won't ever take off points for that unless I think it was a real honest-to-goodness attempt to say that hydrogen was bound to multiple different things. Okay. And then you'll lose points. What you'll likely or more likely see is when you're writing out a structure, I might say, are you really trying to say hydrogen's bound between those two? Or I might circle it on an exam and ask you about it later. Okay. So just be aware there are some little subtleties to that that can change it. Okay. So that gets us into um, looking at our abbreviated Lewis structures. We could also push it into Vesper structures. Okay. Vesper was looking at the three-dimensional structure for this. That gets a little bit more difficult to draw. It's definitely not going to be condensed. We'd be looking at each of those atoms. We'll typically try and draw it as best we can, showing the bond angles. The bond angle for each of those carbons, how many bonds do they have? Four, which means what shape? Tetrahedral, the bond angle is 109.5. So you'll notice that I'm at least faking an attempt to make that bond angle look a little bit closer to 109.5 as opposed to a straight line. Okay. We'll try and put all the largest atoms in the same plane. And then we'll go back through. That center carbon is a tetrahedron. We can add on that extra detail. So we now have a Vesper sketch. Okay. which also corresponds with our line angle. You might also see line angle abbreviated, which is a condensation of having this as well as putting in just saying CH3 and then showing that bond angle. Okay. So you get all sorts of different variations from each of these. Try not to get too confused or bogged down in memorizing any one of them. You need to be comfortable manipulating all of them. Okay. Questions about any of that? Yes. Hydrogens, how they're implied in 
we always write the height when we're writing down these structures? It depends on what you want to do. Okay? If I don't particularly care about those hydrogens, I might imply them. And if I'm going to imply them, the last way we could see this structure drawn out Would be like that. So that's a good point. I forgot about the whole implications. We could go through. I've got a point. Point. Each of those is carbon. That carbon has how many bonds shown? One, which means three hydrogens. There it is. That carbon is a point. Two bonds shown, which means two hydrogens. One's erased. Implied to that position. You'll notice I did not imply the hydrogen attached to oxygen. You're not allowed to imply those. You can only imply hydrogens attached to carbons. Wait, can you explain that again? Which part? The implied part. The implied hydrogens. Uh, okay. So we can go back through it. We've got a point here. So a point means a carbon. How many bonds are shown to this point? One. Carbon has to have four bonds to be neutral. I don't see any charges, so it's assumed neutral, which means I have three bonds missing. Those three bonds must be to hydrogen. When we move to this guy in the middle, two bonds shown. It's, again, no formal charge shown, okay, which means two bonds shown has to be neutral. I need four bonds. Two are shown. Two are left over. Must be to hydrogen. And I erased it by accident up there. And then I also get this one every so often. What atom is this? Okay. Every point is a carbon unless otherwise specified. How do you otherwise specify? By just writing the atom right next to it. Okay. So we're showing a bond between that carbon and oxygen. That is the end of class. Sorry, guys. Um, I will post these slides because I think this one went a little bit better than the last one.